Okay, folks, this is a little bit more detail on the um, some applications of deep learning, mainly based on work I've done over the last year and a half or so. And uh, we cover earthquakes, COVID data analysis, some particle physics work, and some molecular dynamics work, where we're tr discovering uh, deep learning uh, networks that can reproduce the results of complex simulations. And uh, this is just an overview. It is not teaching you how to do these. It's just meant to motivate you by seeing the types of things you have to do. And you will learn how actually different types of problems have different types of networks and, and things like that. Hello, folks. This is Jeffrey Fox. And uh, we have the first real slide of this section, Technology of Deep Learning. And it just try to put things in a bit of context. In a previous lesson, we uh, looked at Google Colab, IPython Notebooks, and Jupyter Notebooks. They're the sort of user interface. Then we actually used uh, TensorFlow, Keras, and we used the MNIST dataset. So TensorFlow and PyTorch are the two currently most important uh, deep learning systems. Keras is a user interface which used to cover everything, PyTorch, TensorFlow and MXNet, now it just covers TensorFlow. And MNIST is the uh, NIST uh, handwriting data set. Um, and then when we give or take a problem, we now need to go to Keras, TensorFlow, or PyTorch. Keras is got the same effectively as an interface to the components of TensorFlow. But they're all effectively Py Python uh, uh, interfaces. And you just choose what you want to put together. And there's lots of flexibility. And whenever I ask, hmm, what's allowed? It ends up that everything's allowed. OK, let's um, look here at um, what, the, what the basic earthquake problem is and how we might use deep learning. Uh, we have um, lots of quite a lot of data on earthquakes. Uh, in the USGS uh, compendium, there are about two and a half million points across the world. And there's almost half a million in Southern California. And that's dated from 1990 to, to essentially now. Um, each event has usually fi five numbers, a magnitude, a position, latitude, longitude, a depth, and a timestamp. And <clears throat> if you look at the uh, probability of occurrence, the chance of a small earthquake is much larger than a big earthquake by a magnitude change of one is a factor of 10, roughly, in the occurrence probability. So we have lots of small events <coughs> in that sample, and we're trying to predict the big events. Now, the big events are big in an obvious fashion because the energy is actually proportional to probably 10 to the 1.5 times m, and so. The big earthquakes have a lot of lot of energy in them. And there's a, obviously a huge difference in energy between magnitude seven and three. And here is from uh, uh, Michigan University um, website, and Michigan Technical University. We have a sort of classification of the earthquakes. Eight is a great earthquake. Seven to eight is major. Uh, six to seven is can be pretty damaging, and things below that are modest in, in their impact. And here is the number per year. Uh, the great earthquakes are less than one per year. Um, seven to eight is around 20 per year. And of course, it dramatically increases as you go down in magnitude. Um, OK, and so we're trying to would describe why it's, uh, you sort of need to do data analysis to predict earthquakes. Um, and when you think about earthquakes, uh, and if you look at the so-called earthquake science field and the earthquake engineering field, earthquake science is this, predicting the forecast, the occurrence of an earthquake. And earthquake engineering is predicting what happened when an earthquake occurs, which is study of the uh, response of buildings, but also the response of the Earth, which is propagating the force of the earthquake through uh, seismic waves. Both of these are computationally intense problems. 
And the second is probably uses the most computer time. And in some sense, it's, it's not the most easy, it's the one where you can get reliable answers most easily. Because the uh, transmission of waves, say, through the Los Angeles Basin, uh, can be uh, calculated reasonably reliably. And, um, and of course, once you describe, decide how the Earth is shaking, you can uh, put in the engineering of the buildings and see what happens to the buildings. Forecasting the occurrence of the earthquake is pretty difficult because earthquakes are due to faults slipping on each other, and they are not going to, and they're pretty deep these faults, and you do not have detailed information on the boundary between these faults. You just know that they're squeezed up against each other, and if you have two things squeezed up against each other, every now and then they're slip. And that slipping is what in physics you call a phase transition. It's not a deterministic thing. It doesn't slip a little bit every now and then. It either slips nothing or a lot. And a lot, of course, if it's very a lot, is your great earthquake. And we know little, we have little data um, on what the earthquake plates are, li are like when they rub against each other. And we don't know much, therefore, about the friction loss between them. And we certainly don't know the detail to decide exactly where it will slip. So that means that if we think about this as a problem, there are a lot of hidden variables. Because we don't have enough data to compute it as an Abbott this year simulation. And of course, that sound makes uh, deep learning sound attractive because it is full of hidden neurons. And you, the idea is, well, whatever the data is, it's the same data that produces all earthquakes. So if you have a whole bunch of earthquakes, then you train the a network on the earthquakes that happen, then somehow it is learned implicitly about the data, which is the friction loss between the faults, and therefore can be used to predict new earthquakes uh, if you have enough data. So this is sort of interesting. I think this application really highlights the word hidden variable, because it truly is hidden. We do not know what the faults are doing. Um, so we can observe the data about the earthquake, namely the sharks and the uh, water gurgling out when there's some about to be an earthquake, or the uh, goats doing whatever goats do. But we don't actually have the physics needed to put in the boundary conditions for a real simulation. So we're trying to map the observed data into a future forecast for for um, earthquakes. And so this is what one of my friends, John Rundle at UC Davis, calls pattern informatics. And it underlies a lot of deep learning. You want to learn patterns which uh, and their consequences. And then when you come to a new uh, scenario, you just feed in that pattern. OK, here we are. So. The earthquake data is recorded as time-stamped events. And um, we divide it uh, it's from 1990 to, to effectively now, by the middle of 2019. So we take all but the first two, four years, 2017 and 2018. Uh, and then we actually initially, we just bin them in time to see what we could do. Um, and then we used uh, on the next slide are some predictions, which um, correspond to earthquake activity in Southern California, where I said we had a total of uh, almost half a million data points. And the way we think about this problem is we actually make it into a classic deep learning problem, a bunch of images. At any, for any year, we, we cover um, Southern California with an image. That image is a bunch of pixels, each of which is about 11 kilometers on the side, and um, we just count the earthquake activity. And so the signal in that pixel is um, uh, the total earthquake activity, total magnitude, or actually we tend to we use something called log log energy or square fourth root of energy. Uh, we can't use energy because energy varies so much that it uh, completely gets wiped out by the activation layer because uh, activation layers can't cope with uh, these huge factors which have 
uh, well over a million in the in the in the magnitude corresponding to the different earthquakes. And then we have five timestamps in a time series, and um, we use what's called the convolutional LSTM, which uh, you can look up, but it's a mixture of the filters you get in convolutional um, deep learning with the uh, time series based the recurrent neural nets, which is what an LSTM is. Now we first applied this to a very, uh, to an actually a theoretical model, and we got perfect answers. And I interpret that as saying that um, if there is a theory, then you can learn the theory. And the model had a real clear theory producing earthquakes. Here is actually, we looked at uh, time, uh, time intervals when there was not an earthquake, and here was our prediction. You can see the probability is always essentially zero. Here is the probability when there is an earthquake. In fact, there was one, a uh, few cases when it's a probability almost one, but nearly all the cases are probability one. This is a log plot, so this one here is not so big. Now the only, I see it's sort of interesting. I think it's pretty certain that we will succeed in getting all this to work as long as there is a theory behind earthquakes. If there's no actual theory, but there's some random nonsense, then it may not work. We'll have to see. Here is sort of the results of the convolutional LSTM. Of zero is 2017, one is 2018. Um, this is the uh, prediction. This is the data. These are just the pixels. You can see the squares of the pixels. Each of those uh, squares is one pixel. And uh, we're predicting uh, here the we, we feed in all the data and predict the 2017 or 2018. And you can see that it's not perfect by any means, but uh, there's a um, look at various measures of success, R squared or structural similarity. Uh, these are not too bad. And we also get similar answers whether we use this convolutional LSTM, where the filters are actually mixed up with the time sequencing or with the convolutional network itself where you separate them. Where you add convolutional network plus an LSTM. And that's on this side. So that's sort of similar with the CNM plus LSTM, possibly slightly better. Um, this is the general um, situation. These set of pixels are fed in here. They go through a dense network fully connected to to map them into the variables that we track through the uh, recurrent neural network, which is here, where the weight matrix in the recurrent neural network has convolutional filters. And then we train it to predict the next year's earthquake. So that's one example. Okay, here we have uh, another approach to uh, earthquake prediction, not using a convolutional LSTM, which is viewing the earthquake as an, as an, as an image and looking at that image structure and the fault structure and things. Here we're just viewing it as a set of time series in, in space, and we're looking at them. We're looking at them all together, we're just not using the spatial relationship. And we're looking at just lots and lots of different time intervals. Here we have tomorrow's earthquake. Over here we have, let's see this one here. This is predicting an earthquake in the next four years. What is the strength of the earthquakes in the next four years? And we have everything here from uh, two thirds of a month, and one and a half months here, three months, six months, a year ahead, uh, two years, the next two years, and I say the next four years. Here we um, here we have um, the next uh, um, we have a year, and then another year. So that's a year delayed by one, and here we have. Delay two years and then look at two years. So we're trying to see if we can design a network that is sort of giving you a broad prediction for the future. And we're not. This is still work in progress. The exact way how to do these predictions for some things, which has intrinsic uh, variation, is pretty unclear. So we'll get. We're, 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 this data is from 19. Uh, 
90, we're actually rerunning the same thing with over 25,000 days from uh, 1950. Well, now we come to the, the, another more or less complete analysis, that of COVID data. Here we have a collection of um, some number of counties. We started off with 110. Then in August uh, 2020, we had 314. Actually, today uh, we now have over 3,000 counties, each of which has uh, recorded some medical information like the um, number of hospital beds compared to the population or the percentage of seniors in the population of the county. And it tries, we're trying to uh, correlate that data with the measured uh, fatalities and cases. And uh, <coughs> Here we're doing again a recurrent neural net, an LSTM, window sizes from 5 to 13. Um, and this is, most of these are with size 9. And we have um, a various number of properties, these properties telling you what's going on. Actually, the best data is sort of processed and has the fewest number of properties, 12. Um, and then we add some special properties called encodings which are put in time, which try to teach the LSTM what time of day is and things like that. And um, we predict, uh, remember in the earthquake case, we were going to go four years in advance. Here we're doing at most 14 days in the future. And um, well, this, they're all using the same uh, code at the time this uh, job was completed. This analysis, there were 3,300 lines of Python. Now there'll be another thousand or so. Um, we are using two models, either a pure LSTM, a pure recurrent neural net, or a so-called transformer architecture, which was introduced, because uh, in speech at least it did somewhat better than LSTMs, much better in fact. It's replaced LSTMs for speech analysis. The transformer comes from Google, and the, but it's been advanced uh, especially by Facebook and others. Um, so here we have the uh, pure LSTM description, and you can see that the data is nicely learned. The jagged uh, weekly behavior, that's, that is of course not really a real effect. This is, you know, this is another model of people dying. It's a model of whatever data we have, and the data uh, on, the birth, on the cases and and fatalities is, is underreported in the weekends. Uh, people wait to the Monday or Tuesday before they report. Actually, they actually wait to Tuesday because Monday is also low in nearly all the data. And here at the bottom, we in this red is the error, as it was in the previous slide. And in general, it's quite small. There's a glitch here, but probably the data's, you know, there may be uh, something forgot to report or was not recorded properly. So this data has pretty, uh, it's hardly perfect. All right, so this has these, the, the later data with 200, um, over 200 uh, uh, days involved. Um, here's another uh, sample of this data using the transformer. And um, you can see that uh, this transformer actually automatically gives its own prediction of the error, which is shown here when these, they're actually one, two, three, four, seven different curves here. Uh, it's got a somewhat smaller error, and um, the, the fatalities have larger errors than the than the actual cases themselves. These are actually the data over all the counties, just summed up. And uh, the normalization should be looked at with a sconce because this is artificially normalized because we take the data and renormalize it so it all lies between naught and one right at the beginning. And we can, of course, some of the data we unpack and make it real cases. This one here, we have not. <coughs> it's also actually fitting not, a, not the number of um, uh, cases and deaths, it's fitting the square root of the number of cases and deaths. That's because if you have counting statistics like this, uh, the square root of, um, of a a recorded count should have error order one, whereas if you have a count of order n, the, the error in normal counting statistics is square root of n. 
Here we have the transformer model again, and we are looking at uh, particular regions of, um, here we have uh, New York City. Of course, it's jumped up after this. This goes to August. It went up over Christmas. Uh, and here we have fatalities. Here we have cases. Note the scare. This has actually been renormalized to real, real from the uh, the previous cut plot was raw data from the prediction, which was normalized uh, um, to they say to to work with neural nets by being each 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 county was between naught and one. The results plotted were much bigger than one because they had lots of counties added up. And um, here we have Cook County, Chicago, and um, again for cases and fatalities. And here's the last of these plots. It is, uh, I'll get more of these, is again the transformer model, because that gives the best fits. And here we have, uh, uh, actually these numbers are looking pretty different. Here we have uh, Seattle with King County, Washington, which uh, has a bump here. Uh, Los Angeles also had a bump along those times. Uh, the way the disease developed was different in different parts of the country. Um, the fatality data is pretty rough in both of these cases. Um, all right, so that's uh, we we I have many more slides on this particular study, and there's something we can look into more detail if we want to to see how to make all this work and how to compare transformers with the current neural nets and things like that. So that's uh, we're now going to get on with another example from particle physics. Here is another example from particle physics in the um, Large Hadron Collider, the ATLAS experiment. I should say, I think, I forget whether this is ATLAS or CMS. I think this is these examples. This work comes from the CMS um, collaboration, but I think the event pictures are from ATLAS. There are two major um, experiments at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, they're actually very different, but they, to an outsider, they look the same because they try to do everything. These are, when you design these interesting experiments, you really wanted to do a great job because you weren't certain what you were looking for. So you detect charged particles, neutral particles, and so on. Uh, because the particles of interest, Higgs bosons, W bosons, they decay into interest in interesting fashions. They either decay into jets, this is a jet. It's a huge amount of, Closely, particles close to each other heading in a single direction. And here is two jets, because we had two quarks produced. Here we had one quark or one gluon produced. Here we have three jets corresponding to a, a weak boson and a quark produced. And what we measure in the apparatus is actually how much energy is flowing in each direction. So you can see here. Here is a huge amount of energy flowing out of the event. The protons are colliding here. <coughs> then normally all the energy just follows the original protons. Every now and then you have a so-called hard scattering where you produce these nifty, very high mass objects. And if the object is high mass, it's going to decay. It's not going to um, give its energy out into the direction of the protons is sitting largely at rest, and it will just spew its energy off to the side. And so the characteristic of interesting events is lots of energy to the side, and you need to be able to try to find an efficient uh, way of detecting that. Uh, a long time ago, uh, I, with um, a famous, much more famous person than me, Stephen Wolfram, who set up Mathematica, came up with the so-called Fox Wolfram moments, which was a way of taking an average over that energy, which I showed you spurting out in different directions. And these moments were called H sub L. And um, there were the John polynomial moments, and these they were calculated with the momentum, which at uh, relativistic energies, for relativistic systems which we're working on is the same as the energy, which I showed in the previous slide. And you just calculated something very simple. So this was a trivial amount of calculation, and it just said, calculate H sub Ls. 
And now this is actually, they say, <coughs> this is one of my most successful publications. I didn't realize at the time I was doing that work. It's had 1,648 citations. And it um, needs an actual amount of computing. And now it's sort of starting to be replaced by sophisticated deep learning methods, which instead of using simple ideas that, let's think of a measure <coughs> sensitive to all the energy going in a particular angle, they are actually learning the um, structure with a deep learning network, which here is comes from the CMS experiment called JediNet. And I assume that this is the way it will be done in the future, and my citations will decline. Um, the next slide here is for work done with Vikram Judeo and JCS, a student uh, in intelligent systems engineering. And it's uh, trying to um, improve the ability to simulate nanoparticles. And it uses the machine learning to choose the time step dynamically and choose the consistency parameter which is needed to ensure that uh, the initial conditions match what you simulate. And uh, we get actually a speed up of three by using machine learning uh, or deep, deep learning to actually do all of this stuff. And uh, there's some pictures here which uh, show the improvements here in terms of the progress of the simulation. Uh, here's the clock time, if you like, on the computer. And uh, here is the uh, time simulated per step. And that gets bigger as you increase the, as you learn the better time steps. And here we see the simulated time. Here we have computational steps. And here we have the simulated time. And as we uh, as we learn better and better, we get up to here where we're actually simulating a, uh, probably a factor of three or four more, um, going a factor of three or more, far, three or more faster to phase space. Okay, here we have the next few slides, uh, which we start with some work at Indiana University with JCS and Fikram again is uh, an important class of um, the use of deep learning to do to actually run simulations. So you have a computer code that calculates something. Here we're calculating structure of uh, nano nanoparticle systems, the where the ions are and what their density is and things like that. And they're confined in some fashion. So you know how to use the uh, Classic molecular dynamics equations involving the forces between the particles and uh, Newton's laws for the particles. And what you, the idea is that you actually train a neural net to be able to reproduce the result of a simulation. Because the simulation depends on parameters. And the idea is that you would write a neural net which feeds in the parameters and gets out the answer. In this simple example here, the answer is actually just a few numbers related to densities. And um, we have a, actually end up trying a very simple network. We have five input parameters, three output parameters, and we have uh, two hidden layers here. And they're all fully connected as a so-called multi-layer perceptron, one of the simplest deep learning networks. And it easily outperforms all other forms of machine learning on this for this type of problem to learn uh, the results of a simulation. We take 5,000 simulations roughly, and um, we are then able to have a system where you have any choice of these five numbers, it will give you in a fraction, namely a tenth of the fifth times faster, it will give you the res uh, result compared to the classical simulation code. And if you look here on the uh, bottom right, it actually has lots of straight lines. Those straight lines are the uh, testing data, where you um, compare the uh, results of the neural net with the uh, with results of from simulations which results were not used in the training. 
this is particularly interesting for education, because in education you tend to want to run a lot of simple jobs. And you also want the result quick. You don't want to write, well, wait a few, a few weeks for the large scale simulation to run on a supercomputer. Uh, this idea is, for instance, used by General Electric in the design of uh, aircraft engines. They run 200 computational fluid dynamics simulations of the engine. And then the engineer can play around with the input parameters and instantaneously get results. And so that changes uh, overnight or a few hour wait for the results of a particular set of choice to essentially instantaneous. Here is a scurrilously named paper called, where the title of the paper is Up to 2 Billion Times Acceleration of Simulations Using a Deep Neural Network Architecture. Uh, here it is on archive, and they look at 10 cases, and of course they get speed ups in all cases. They use a much more complicated network, because uh, they're trying to find a network that works everywhere. I somehow doubt that this is the right network, but we'll see. Uh, this is right. This field is right at the beginning, and so you're not going to get optimized results. This is uh, this involves a lot of convolutional layers because they're trying to predict uh, visualizations of the, uh, which is the because lot of these lot of simulations of physical systems, you go from initial conditions to final results. Those final results are usually represented as densities of particles or or Weather for weather densities and things like that, pressures and velocities and stuff like that. And uh, hi, here are some sample results from the two billion paper. Uh, they give um, four examples of uh, of uh, the final results which have been predicted. Here is the uh, true example from the climate simulation. Here is the emulated result. It's like maybe the colors, I mean, obviously the colors just change for, to make clear what's what. Here is the ocean, and here is the simulation. Here's the ocean um, from the surrogates. And um, obviously they look all look pretty similar. Uh, here is some more simpler, but more easy to, under, to judge comparisons. Here, this one is a galaxy simulation. Uh, and you can obviously not tell the difference between the simulation and the emulator, which is the, I would call surrogates. This one's a little less um, clean. I'm not quite certain what that means. But clearly the main uh, thrust of this, which is a fusion simulation, the uh, surrogates uh, which um, do reasonably, although notice the scatter is from the surrogates, which is the Orange, not the simulator, which is a straight line. So that's sort of surprising. Um, if you look at um, over here, you see the um, the difference between this network called dense, and that's what dense means. It that is their fa that is the network they're so proud of and develop in this paper. And here you have the value of the loss function from. Uh, which they claim is a manually designed DNN. I'm not quite certain how hard they really tried. I am slightly surprised that uh, you can't do much better than they claim. But um, the orange here is the manually designed DNN, and the blue is the um, non-DNN deep learning case, which um, uh, I'm not surprised that the blue is. Uh, Bigger than one. One means the dense equals whatever you're comparing it with. Greater than one means that the uh, original, uh, the other method, the manual DNN or the other deep learning is worse because the loss function is bigger. The only case where that's not true is around here, where it's either essentially the same or actually the um, manual design DNN beats. The dense on uh, the so-called JAG scalars, which is actually that one over here, which wasn't so good. Um, that's the fusion simulation, and um, here we have um, over here. You actually have the speed up, and here is the magic two billion, which occurs for the climate simulation, 
and uh, it just decreased. It's non-trivial for all cases, and um, we're here. Uh, with, if I look at the work on nanoparticles we did, we were around 10 to the fifth, so we're sort of here. Um, so I think I'm sure I, I don't think this is quite as revolutionary or as um, clean as they say, partly because they don't actually have a speed up of two billion because they have to do 39 in the case of climate 39 actual simulations. And that means that um, they can't possibly get a speed up of two, two billion until they've done a huge number of uh, lookups. So, in fact, they have to do probably two billion or more lookups uh, to get a, that proper speed up. But they will get substantial speed ups once the number of lookups get above 39. Okay, so let's. Uh, that's the end of this discussion of sample results. The next slide gives some more detail on the actual uh, applications looked at. One here, which gives you the um, time which we took running, uh, the number of points in the data set, which I say ran from 39 for climate to 14,000 for the simpler cases. This is a listing, you can see there are various. Pretty wide range of uh, galaxy modeling, ocean, seismic, fusion. So this is a reasonably uh, climate, uh, climate uh, with uh, aerosol and, cl and the model, ocean model simulations, and they all work pretty well. So I would say this is bound to get a lot more attention. Here is uh, the last two slides show a different way of looking at um, simulations with recurrent neural nets. There you are mapping an input to an output, one to what, well, one time slice to the last time slice. Here we're mapping, we're looking at the sequence um, of um, the molecular dynamics equations. They're typically integrated using Newton's laws that the, the, the acceleration equals the force. And you just iterate that equation called the so-called Villette method, uh, which just tells you the difference approximation you use to solve this problem. And um, you find the one in, in, in here we actually compare um, the uh, results. These are four different views of the um, actual real molecular simulation. Here are the same four views of the prediction from the uh, uh, neural net. Sequence neural nets are very important. They're what you use for speech recognition, uh, translation, and problems like that. Convolutional nets, which we lose in the previous slide, are what you use for images, uh, things which are not time dependent. Time series like that earthquake and this problem here, where we're looking not at learning the final result, but being able to project particles in time. Uh, then uh, we're using these recurrent neural nets, uh, which are often you, you t the most sophisticated is called a long short term memory, LSTM. And uh, if you look at these results here, you'll find that um, if you take the uh, Villette method, uh, here the, um, if you take a DT of 0.1, uh, the error is just catastrophic. Here's the error, it goes up to 10 to the 23. Even if you do 0.01, it's um, not very good. And here we have the errors for um, the neural net approach, and it's very much better. Um, okay, here's the last slide, which just gives you the picture of uh, the actual neural net, which you can study in great detail. You'll see there are two layers of LSTMs. That's quite common to have double layers or multiple layers of either recurrent neural nets or convolutional neural nets. You have various um, fully connected networks to map, input, map internal variables to output variables or input variables to to um, tra to, to internal variables and. <coughs> 
in this particular case for the problems we looked at, we got up to about 100,000 or more trainable parameters. And these, are, these things here are the cells, and they're very sophisticated. You really have to spend a long time trying to understand what they want. Perhaps the most interesting thing is to look at the what you have. Here is the input, here is the output, and here is something very important called the history. The history is what is passed from one time set to the next, and it's how you learn a sequence. In another approach, which is also used for so-called sequence-to-sequence -sequence mapping with deep learning, uh, this is called attention. And that's used in the so-called transformer or reformer models, which actually many think are actually better than recurrent nets for this type of problem. So this shows that uh, what we had to do, where the JCS who did this had to decide on the number of layers, which were two for LSTMs. He had to define, decide on the time step, which was five of the, of the time series. And he had to actually decide on the number of replications in this direction. LSTMs feed the same answer to lots of different um, uh, <coughs> inputs and tries to actually get uh, some advantage of statistics because they're initialized differently, but otherwise they're the same. And so they get, you can train there for an average over the results of multiple weight choices. Pretty sophisticated, and I think we're still not being done in an optimal fashion. So this is the end of the part of the course, which um, gives you some examples. Uh, we did both recurrent and convolutional, and we um, and uh, both of those are very important. Probably the most spectacular answers have come from, well, both are very important, because speech recognition is a spectacular advance from, uh, uh, from uh, deep learning. And of course, image processing is hugely impacted by the powerful deep learning algorithms. And those together tell you about recurrent for sequence mapping and convolutional for image. But in the case of the surrogates, which we're effectively using convolutional methods when we're trying to predict images or when we're trying to look at the structure of um, earthquakes, which are images effectively with local. The reason why you, the convolutional networks are good, they enhance local structure. When things nearby are expected to be related, then you want to use a convolutional network. All right, so let's. Uh, well, now we finish this lesson and go on to the next lesson.